Hello and welcome to episode 109 of the Haskin Cast podcast. I am your host, Scott Haskin, because no one came to fill in for me. We have a great show for you this week, a really wide variety of topics that I talk to my guest. You guys may remember my episode or dual episode, I should say, with uh, Chandra Jefferson. This is Tom Jefferson, a very, very great guy, very talented entertainer. And uh, we, we talk about a lot of really cool stuff. So this is definitely one that you're going to want to uh, sit down, grab a cup of tea or coffee uh, or a beer and just uh, relax and enjoy uh, great, great times. Uh, let's see if you're listening to this in real time, I'm almost done with this single. My God, this has been the most difficult single I've ever mixed. It's every time I think I've nailed it, I export it. I listen to it in a few different places and I'm like, no, it's all wrong. And I, I kind of try to fix it. And then I go, no, it's all wrong. I don't know why I can't nail this one. It's, it's a challenge. I, I've mixed (laughs) thousands of songs and I don't know why this one's so difficult, but I'll get there. Uh, in between, uh, you know, I'll finish the uh, mix for the day and then I'll start working on the new album. So that's coming along nicely. I've got a couple songs done for it already. Still hoping for uh, mid-July on that as we're creeping up on June in uh, 2020. The lockdown's kind of helping because, uh, you know, as much as I miss my walks on the strip and would love to finish that third Vegas book, it's uh, kind of a good time to just stay home and keep working and, uh, you know, just do a little exercising at home since I'm not out uh, walking. Uh, but I, you know, it, it would be nice to get some fresh air in that, but, uh, you know, I I have stuff to do. I want to be safe and I want to get things done and that's what it's all about. So that's pretty much, uh, what's going on here. Not a whole lot, uh, exciting stuff. I'm really just locked down on these projects and then keeping the podcast going, uh, be back next week with another amazing guest. But for now I'm excited to talk to Tom and I think you guys will really enjoy this conversation. And I learned a ton of stuff that I didn't know. So this was a great interview for me. And uh, we'll be back with Tom right after these words from our sponsor. MJ&J Farms would like to invite you to experience the power of full-spectrum CBD oil. MJ&J Farms sells high-quality, organic, full-spectrum CBD oil tincture. Our oil comes from high-quality hemp plants grown in northern Arizona. We're a small family farm, and we put our hearts into growing a quality product. We did everything by hand, planting, growing, harvesting, and milling. We were involved in every step of production, so we can guarantee the quality of our product. We chose to mix our extract with organic, cold-pressed hemp seed oil, grown and processed in Oregon. Once we had harvested our plants, we worked with local Arizona companies to create our CBD extract and then to turn that extract into our full-spectrum CBD oil tincture. Our product is 100% American-made. Visit our website, mjjfarms.com, to get more information on the benefits of full-spectrum CBD oil or to find out how you can speak with us directly to get all of your questions answered. J&J Farms. Quality from soil to oil. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I am really excited to bring you my guest this week for episode 109 of the Haskin Cast podcast. God, we're getting up there. The incredibly talented, very friendly and kind Tom Jefferson. Tom, how are you today? I'm good, Scott. How are you? I'm great, thank you. I'm really excited that I was uh, finally able to find some time to get you on the show. Oh, good. Yeah, I'm happy to be on the show. Well, you know, Chandra talked you up so much, and we hadn't met yet. And uh, and I thought immediately, yeah, I've got to get him on the show. And then as we've gotten to know each other a little bit here and there, uh, even more so. So I, I really appreciate you taking some time out to talk with me. All right. Let's start with you uh, as uh, as a musician because that's kind of your uh, one of your staples. Is it is it getting really tough now uh, through the whole not being able to perform because of the virus situation? Well, yeah, uh, our uh, you, you you lived in in Chandler like you told me before we started the podcast. I did, and uh, and so we're in the Sedona, Arizona, and I was working for almost fifteen years at a ranch and cottonwood called the Blazing M Ranch. And it's actually a chuck wagon style food 
and a cowboy show. And uh, I was the comic relief in the show. Kind of looked like a goofy character called Otis. And I talk like this. But then I, <laughs> but then I sing with my big voice. Kind of like what uh, Jim Neighbors used to do when he was doing Gomer Pyle, you know? Okay, yeah. But then, yeah, we, we were shut down after the... Uh, uh, you know, the COVID-19 thing hit with the pandemic there. Pretty bad. Yeah, I've heard that it's, uh, they're they're kind of feeling that it's not likely that they'll reopen. It's a very strong possibility. The owner there, she's a wonderful lady. Uh, her name is Lori Mibri, and uh, she was she originally from uh, up in near the San Francisco area and was a teacher. Uh, but she and her husband, uh, he owns a Coble Banker, which is a, uh, you know, real estate company there in Cottonwood. And they've run that ranch for almost 25 years. Wow. And uh, a lot of a lot of tours, a lot of uh, bus tours from all over the country. And, of course, with the pandemic happening, everything got shut down and no one is is doing anything right now. So uh, it's been hard on that. It really has. Yeah. Yeah. It's it, one, of the, one of the things that I've really thought about throughout this process is once we start really fully reopening everything, what is going to be left for us to reopen? I don't know. You know, I would imagine, especially a lot of those family-based businesses are uh, might not be around. And I'm hopeful that maybe some investors will see a good opportunity because it's not like the businesses themselves has failed. It's that they, you know, couldn't withstand several months of not operating. And who really prepares for that? Oh, I know. I know. It's It's been tough. It's been tough. So if you're an investor out there and you're looking for something good to invest in, that sounds like a pretty solid place. I mean, 26 years of operation, uh, how how can you argue against that? When the doors are open, people are going to need places like this to go back to. Oh, I know. Yes. Now, you're you're also an actor, which I, I like. So you do music, but you're also an actor. And that really gives you some good versatility. Do you prefer one over the other or do you just like to perform? No, I, I like all of that. Uh like I told you before we started the podcast, I grew up in Los Angeles. That's where I was born and uh, actually met Chandra in San Diego. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. And her her mother actually was a talent agent and she was the very first female talent agent there in San Diego, which is quite a big deal. Mm -hmm. But she became my agent. And that's how I met uh, Chandra, which, of course, was her, is her daughter. And um, we've been together now for like 43 years. Wow. <laughs> and you guys put on a really, really wonderful concert. Uh, I, I want to say about a month or so ago uh, on Facebook Live, and I oh. just I enjoyed the the camaraderie between you two. You just play so well together. It's it's obvious that you're very comfortable as musicians with each other. Oh yeah, absolutely. She she knows me. I know her. You know, I can just give her a look. She gives me a look, and I said, Oh, okay. I don't have to say. <laughs> I know exactly what she means. <laughs> Which is always a good thing in so many oh, ways. It is. <laughs> what, uh, did you guys enjoy that? I mean, it's, it's to me, it's kind of strange, the concept of doing a live performance when there's nobody there to give you that energy that you feed off from the crowd. Yeah, that's, that's a little difficult because when that happens, it, 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 you depend on the crowd to give you that energy. And, mm when you can't uh, really see them and they see you, but you, you can't really see them and you can't really get, pick up their vibes and all that, their energy, then yeah, it, it, it makes it difficult. That's true. I was talking to my dad recently about that same concept, but within uh, the world of sports, because one of the things that I've heard they're considering is that, that they would start up baseball, you know, fairly soon, but they would do it without a crowd and that they would just, uh, you know, do a paid televised thing. If you wanted to buy a ticket uh, you can't go to the game, but you can buy a ticket and watch it uh, live on on the internet. And I thought, but what effect does that have on the game when there's nobody there cheering and pumping them up? And you know, especially a sport like hockey, where they're the fans oh. are right there along the glass. Oh, I know. It's that would be very interesting, <laughs> very different for sure. It would. And I was thinking you could do like a Zoom concert where you can see uh, at least some of the people watching you, but the more right. people that are there, the windows get smaller and smaller. Right. And, it, you know, I don't know. It just doesn't feel like the right venue. I kind of like the Facebook Live thing. Yeah, I like that. That's that's a lot of fun. But it's hard to read the comments of what people are saying while you're trying to perform. Just like, stop talking. Let me do my thing. 
<laughs> yeah, they come in all the time and they're kind of kind of peeking at that and trying to perform at the same time. So it's like, you know, I'm doing two things. <laughs> Mm-hmm. But I thought you guys did great. I, I didn't feel well, like the, the performance suffered because you weren't playing in front of people. It just kind of felt like you guys were just having a fun, you know, at, at home jam. We were. Absolutely. Now, are you a, a writer as well? Uh, writing, not music, uh, actually uh, stories. I uh, When I was younger, I wrote uh, science fiction. I was very much into science fiction. Mm, okay. And... Uh, if you want to hear a little backstory on that, uh, I'm not only into science fiction, I was into UFOlogy. And uh, that actually started, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you the story. This is quite a story. I was like eight or nine years old in Los Angeles, and I had this, I guess it was a dream, although I don't know. It's hard to say. And I heard a noise, and I went into the backyard of our house, uh, and there were trees back there, bushes and all that. And I saw this big craft coming down, and the ground opened up, and it went down. So I uh, went down there, and I could hear my footfalls. It was kind of like uh, cylindrical, you know, metal. Mm-hmm. So you can hear that. And then uh, I have to remind you, I'm uh, like 77 now, so I was born in, in uh, the 40s. And this was like uh, close to uh, the 50s. Okay. So all of a sudden, this door opens up like, like that, at, like you would see on Star Trek or any of the other shows. But remind, uh, remember that uh, actually back then, I, I didn't have any reference for anything like that. So that's kind of made it a little, little interesting. How how did I get that idea of a door like that? You know what I mean? Right. Yeah. Well, it, it, and you have to think uh, about the time frame because we're talking there was no Internet. Uh, there was no you know email. There was no. there was no uh, things that you could just go to the theater and watch uh, you know movies about UFOs. Yeah. This was a pretty big event. Right. Well, we had like Buck Rogers, Flash Gordon, and mm-hmm. things like that. Those were the big serials back then. And and you, but they didn't have doors like that. I can tell you right now, no one had a concept of that. So it's like, okay, that's interesting. How I picked that up in, in my dream. Mm-hmm. So anyway, when I woke up the next morning, I noticed there was actually mud on my shoes. It had been raining outside. So I was outside, oh. uh, whether I was sleepwalking or not. I don't know, but. It was such a profound dream for me at a, such a young age that I became very intrigued with the idea of ufology. And uh, actually in Inglewood, California, I, I think you, you know where that is, right? That's oh, yeah. that's the to Los Angeles. Mm-hmm. There was an organization called uh, UFO Amalgamated, and they would bring in pilots and commercial pilots and military pilots who would talk about their experiences with UFOs. And actually one pilot was flying a uh, TWA transatlantic flight. And he said, we were buzzed by this craft that would zigzag and stop in midair. And he said, they were doing things that uh, we didn't have, uh, you know, planes or vehicles back then that could do that. There was no way. So that was uh, that was interesting. And said, we were, we were told not to say anything when we landed because the CIA met us. And they said, if you say anything, this will happen to you and all that. So it was the big hush hush. Oh, sure. Well, it was even now it's pretty taboo for a pilot to talk about their experience, especially if they're if they're flying any kind of uh, commercial flights. Uh, Even now it's frowned upon. But back then, I mean, it's 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 still career risking today. Yeah, You're you're into that, too, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I did a show. uh, I went in Sedona, my friend Michael, that does the uh, Arizona UFO tours. Oh, Uh, I went on his tour with the, the night vision goggles. And man, that was that's seeing the the universe in a whole different perspective. It's very yeah. fascinating. But I was, uh, when I lived in, uh, I think, yeah, I think it was when I was in Chandler, I was uh, driving back from a weekend in Vegas. And uh, I, I used to leave really early in the morning, you know. Uh-huh. And uh, it was on a Monday morning and I was coming back and uh, I saw right over uh, Wikiup, uh, I saw a craft flying somewhat low, maybe 250, 300 feet above the ground. Mm. It wasn't a huge craft, but it was sizable. And the freaky thing was, is that it was just silent. Wow. You know, you're not seeing any exhaust, no afterburners, nothing right. at all. Just, it just was gliding as if right. it no, was. No, uh, no trail behind it or anything. Right. And, uh, and it, and I flew past me and I really wish that I had pulled over and I had a really cheap flip phone back then, but I wish to God I'd have taken some pictures. It was uh it was a very surreal moment. Right. You know, and, and I don't 
necessarily say that everything that we see is extraterrestrial because I think that there's a lot of, you know, uh, secret projects and technology that. Oh, absolutely. So I really don't know whether that was something we made or something that did come from somewhere else. I just know that it was something that I I couldn't define and couldn't explain other than to say it was a craft gliding fairly low mm-hmm. to the ground in front of me. Right. And I don't know what it was. Well, you know, most people think I always wanted to be a singer because my dad had been a singer. He'd been an actor and all that. So it was in my family. However, when I was a kid, I, like I, I love science, I love astronomy. I actually thought I wanted to be an astronomer. So I had a telescope. And so I was out on our front lawn uh, when I was in Los Angeles when I was a kid. And this blue light flew over and I caught it in the telescope and definitely was cylindrical and looked metallic. And it flew over the uh, LAX airport and the the uh, tower tried to contact it and they couldn't help and zip, it just disappeared. That's what they wrote in the LA Times the next wow. morning. Yeah. So you never know. I mean, these things have been around for a long, long time. Oh, sure. Sure. You know, and, and I remember uh, reading about the Battle of L.A. And I really wish I right. had seen if I if there's one UFO event that I could pick to have witnessed, I think it would have been that one. Right. That was pretty amazing. Uh, thousands of rounds shot off and just nothing. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty amazing stuff. But were were you um, do you think that that was a dream then or do you think that that really happened that that? Because, I mean, with the mud on your shoes. Well, that that was certainly uh, evident that I was outside, you know, that uh, I, I don't know. I mean, I could have been sleepwalking, I suppose. And people say, oh, you were sleepwalking. But, you know, I actually, like I said, I went into this room and there was this table and there was a, a schematic on, on the wall of a double star with the planets around it. And then these uh, beings came in that had kind of large craniums. And they spoke to me actually telepathically, not not with not verbally. Mm-hmm. So, and then one came in that had uh, was wearing a, a tunic that had that actually on this tunic the uh, actual double stars on it. And he said, "We've been waiting for you." That's when I woke up. <laughs> oh, you right when you were getting to the good part. I know. <laughs> I wasn't. I wasn't abducted. I wasn't. Abdu- I'm not an ab- abductee. You know? Right, but that begs the question: Was something planted? subconsciously that you just haven't unlocked yet or was it really a dream I, I find it interesting that i mean unless you wore your shoes to bed you were aware enough to even if you were sleepwalking you were cognizant enough to put shoes on right which i find interesting yeah i i know i, I don't even remember doing it but obviously i did yeah mm-hmm. wow that see i love stuff like that because there's that part of me that just loves the mystery of it. And there's that part of me that gets really frustrated because I don't have answers. I know. Well, there, 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 are, ans- there are answers out there, but uh, I don't know if they're actually true or not. It's hard to say. Sure. It's like anything. If there's, if there's enough smoke, then there's fire. Right. Absolutely. And, and I think it would be so weird to think that the, the tiny dot that we are, even within our own galaxy, let alone the millions of galaxies, how is it possible that we're the only beings out there? Right. And we're actually at the edge of our galaxy where our, our solar system is. So you would think that life would actually originate maybe from the center and spread out to the edge. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah, that would make so sense. There could be a lot of life out there. We just haven't identified them or contacted them yet. So who knows? Well, do you ever, because you have, uh, one of the advantages of living in Sedona is how few city lights there are, and you can get a really, really beautiful look at the stars without it being encumbered. Like, I live in Vegas. I'm five minutes from the Strip, so it's light central over here. Do you ever just go out at night and see what's going on? Oh, I do, but I don't have a telescope. I should, you know. Mm -hmm. I'll have to buy one of these days. (laughs) We'll put it on the list. All right. <laughs> well, what kind of um, w- was that kind of the sci-fi that you were writing then? Was UFO related sci-fi? Yeah, actually, I wrote quite a bit uh, about time travel. And mm. one of my stories I wrote was the the uh, character in the story was called Dr. Leonard Vincent. And he had a time machine. He went back in time. I like the idea of time travel. And he got stuck there. So he was trying to remember his own time by in, by inventing things. And he changed his name to Leonardo da Vinci. Oh. And if you read about uh, Da Vinci being a Renaissance man, he actually came up with a tank and a helicopter. So I thought, well, maybe he was a time traveler. Maybe that's a possibility. Very much so. Well, you know, I mean, the stuff that he was doing was so advanced for some of it's advanced for now. Right. 
I I love the concept of time travel. I love the concept of parallel universes. Oh yes. I I don't know that we I don't know if they're possible or not, but I think if they are, I think that when people look at the concept of time travel, they look at, well, you did this and nothing changed. But I think if it's possible, I think what you're creating is a branch of new events off of that timeline. And you're not right. affecting the actual timeline. You're just creating another realm. Right. But people tend to think of it as linear. So if you were to say, uh, you know, I'll, I'll go back and kill Hitler and you do it, that doesn't change our timeline. That just creates another offshoot where Hitler was murdered. Right. That's what I think the parallel universes are, is those alternate timelines. It could well be, yes. I wish so, I wish I could know. <laughs> that's that's where it gets into that frustrating <laughs> yeah, side, you know. Yeah. So were you were you writing like short stories or plays or or movies? Uh, no, I didn't write any stories. Uh, I mean, uh, plays or movies, just kind of short stories. Writing is such a fun outlet, though, because uh, it, it's it's just a blank canvas, and you can create the world any way you want it. It doesn't even have to be logistical. Well, actually, I wrote, I uh, just recently, not, not a couple of years ago, wrote two stories I hadn't written for a long time. One was called Timeless Love, where he goes back in time and uh, finds this gal. And then uh, another one was called Regret, where he had been a serial killer. And he didn't. And you don't know about that at the very beginning of the story, but you find out that he he has all this down in, in a uh, locked up the room of pictures of all these people that he, he murdered, but find, found out that he had actually had been created to be this way when he goes back in time to when he was a child. Wow. I love that concept. Yeah. I probably, uh, you may have to do an NDA, but I could send that to you if you want to read it. Oh yeah. I'd love to. And I'll, I'll sign an NDA. I've, okay. <laughs> I've signed quite a number of those over the years. I'm sure you have, and I have too. If uh, if anybody that uh, that I have signed an NDA with knows me, they know that I know how to keep my mouth shut. <laughs> okay, all right. You uh, know, you know, speaking of the ufology, you know, uh, actually, uh, they had Project Blue Book, which is now a story on History Channel, I believe. Mm -hmm. And the person that was he was hired by the Air Force to debunk UFOs back then. That was like around 1952. And that was the astronomer J. Allen Hynek. Mm. And uh, he came up with the title, Close Encounters of the Third Kind. So when Steven Spielberg decided to do his movie, he actually, I guess, paid him for the use of that title. And actually, Hynek was in the movie. Oh, wow. I didn't know that. Yeah. When, the, when you see it again, where the big craft comes down for the first time, uh -huh. uh, you see this guy come up with a pipe in his mouth and looks like a professor or doctor. That was Heine. Yeah. Oh, I know exactly who you're talking about. Yeah. Wow. I didn't know that was him. That's, that is yeah. fascinating. See, I love little stuff like that. Uh, I think too, that project blue book was an amazing thing. That was one of the first things that I learned about. Um, whenever I would go stay with my grandfather, he would, uh, we would go outside and watch the stars and sometimes we would see a light move and sometimes we wouldn't, um, but he took us, he and my grandma took us to, uh, Wright Patterson because we were, we grew up in Michigan. So it was like a three hour drive to, to Wright Patterson. And that's where he told me the, the whole Roswell story. And right. I'm like six years old. And of course I'm just like, well, can we see him? You know, can we see the bodies? And uh, I'm just fascinated. He's like, no, we can't see him. I'm like, well, what are we doing here then? <laughs> <laughs> you want to see the bodies. Of course you did. Well, sure. Yeah. I want to see him now. If I was your age, then I would have wanted to see them too. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it was, it was, you know, I was probably like 40 years ago, but I, I want to yeah. see him now. I, uh, I was very intrigued from that point on with the whole concept of it, because to me at that point, I hadn't really thought about it as anything that was a real concept. I mean, to me, it was like the, the stories of movies and, right. uh, but that, that was the first thing that really made it real for me. And uh, and I can't go anywhere now without watching the skies. I've I've caught some some things on on uh, pictures and video that I I can only look at it and go mm, that's not normal. True, <laughs> you know? true. That thing has a weird shape and it's not moving like any conventional aircraft mm -hmm. that I know. Um, so yeah, I've I've definitely had my experiences. It's just such a fascinating thing. 
It is. Yes. You know, and uh, Michael was saying on the show, uh, he was talking about the first time that they visited him in his house. And uh, he, okay. he uh, yeah, he has a tour that he goes on where he talks about that. And uh, they just kind of floated him out from the bedroom into the kitchen. And wow, you know, same same thing. It was a telepathic conversation. I see. And they were putting uh, they were feeding movies and things into his head so that he could see what they were talking about. And I'm like, wow, I wish I could just do that. I wish I could just download something into someone's head and not have to explain it. Well, you know, I think telepathy was probably there before we actually had verbal speech because you, you had explorers that went down like like the Amazon and all of a sudden they come up to a village and they said, we saw you in our minds. We knew you were coming. Mm. So obviously, obviously that it's a very old, you know. Sure. I think we've lost a lot of the old ways as, as just like when penguins used to be able to fly and they just stopped flying and now they can't. Right. I think it's kind of the same with us. I think we stopped doing a lot of things that we used to be able to do and now we don't know how to access it. Very true. Very true. I also wonder if animals have telepathy. I think they do because I know, uh, you know, we have dogs and we, we had a, uh, a, a poodle. She was a toy poodle. Uh, we, we had her in Los Angeles. I mean, excuse me. In, in well, I, we had a place in LA and also San Diego. And we came here and actually our second dog, which is Harry, her name was Cammy. But we picked them up in Chandler and they looked like they came from the same litter because they were they were both apricot. Mm. But before she passed away and we knew it was coming, we both heard, Chandra heard and I heard in, in my mind, Daddy, Mommy, please let me go. Wow. Now, whether we were just kind of like thinking that, I think we weren't. I, I believe she was just giving that to us. Well, that's interesting that both of you got that. Yeah, we got it at the same time. So yeah. that's why we, it was quite profound, yeah. Well, that's fascinating. I was thinking more along the lines of how animals tend to know uh, how things work. Like the, if you look at alligators or you look at uh, hippos, they all have their own certain ways that they run their tribes. But it's not like oh, yeah. they can just sit you down and go, okay, son, it's time for me to tell you how it works. But the animals just seem to know and fall in line and understand what their role is. Well, you know, everything actually communicates, uh, whether that would be... Uh, animals or insects or even actually, uh, you know, uh, plants, they, they communicate too with each other. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, there was a show, I don't know if you remember it back in the eighties called real people. Oh yeah. And I remember they did this experiment. This, this experiment had a huge impact on me, uh, mentally. They had, uh, set up, uh, the EEG wires to a plant and they right. had this little cup of shrimp and the shrimp were alive. And it was on a motorized arm. And as soon as the timer went off, the arm turned and dumped the shrimp onto the ground. And as soon as that happened, the EEG meters on the plant just went nuts. Huh. And I thought, okay, so this is why plants grow better when people talk to them and they're supportive and nurturing. They're feeling that energy. They're connecting with it. They're not uh, just living things with no brain. Exactly. Yeah, it's it's fascinating the way that the world really works when you when you start breaking it down to those elements and it's nothing I think like we perceive it. I agree with that for sure. <laughs> yeah. And and being in Sedona now, uh you guys have so many energy lines there. Uh it it definitely has spots where I have walked uh and felt very different than I feel in other places. Do you notice that? Oh, absolutely. You know, the first time we actually came to Sedona was back in 1998, and uh, that was before we moved here. We moved here in 2002, mm -hmm. and uh, Chandra's sister Jules was getting married, and so we came here for the the you know, for for marriage for the celebration and everything else. And I, I took a picture by a tree in what they called the airport vortex. When we got back, I, they developed it, and there was this big bubble from my head all the way up to the tree. I thought, what is that? So I called them back and said, hey, guys, uh, what happened here? Did something uh, happen with the, when you uh, developed? They said, well, whatever was there, it came out. And so you hear about these orbs and these things that are in the air mm -hmm. that you see in Sedona. So there's definitely a lot of energy here. And do I believe in the vortex? Yeah, I do. I, I think they're real. I can definitely say that the couple that I've been to, I have felt, uh, I don't want to say an energy shift because that's not really the right word. I would say almost like it, it was uh, magnified 
you know, whatever right. I was feeling yeah. was magnified. It amplifies. Mm -hmm. So you want to be careful what you're thinking. <laughs> yes, for sure. <laughs> so you guys have been there for a long time. Have you had any uh, any really weird experiences that, uh, since you've been there? No, not really. No. <laughs> I can see the potential for it there. Um, oh, well, yes. Some people have actually uh, done a lot of, you know, uh, hikes. And when they ventured off the trails, all of a sudden they hear voices. Someone said that they thought they were they were actually hit by an arrow or something like that because there's a, a big Native American presence here, obviously. You know. Mm. Now they came in and they 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 actually came in and prayed in Sedona areas, but they didn't live here like we do. Like, oh, okay, really? <laughs> okay, that's interesting. I didn't know that. That's what I heard. Yeah. You know, I, I could see uh, I could see living in Sedona. I think it's beautiful up there. It's very peaceful and tranquil. Right. I, I think the problem for me, because, of course, I live in Vegas, so I'm in a town that's, you know, if it's three in the morning and I want some sushi, I can go get sushi at three in the morning. Oh, I know. Uh, whereas Sedona kind of closes up really early. That's true of New York, too, by the way. Yeah, that's right. We were just there recently last year because Chandra's uh, song actually with a video that she did called Greed Incorporated that was in a festival there in New York. So we went there for the festival and it was wonderful. And we were actually in Junior's Delicate Test. I think, what was that? What's that on? It's near Times Square. Mm -hmm. And almost 1.30 in the morning, the place was packed. Oh, so, yeah. I mean, the town never sleeps. Mm -hmm. Although with all this pandemic, I mean, it's been pretty, you see pictures of Times Square and going, oh my goodness, there's no one there. Yeah, I've been telling everyone that I know uh, in the film industry, if you have a drone, this is the time to get footage that you'll never have an opportunity to get again. No doubt. Or I should say, hopefully never have an opportunity to get again. <laughs> okay. Because, you know, uh, who knows? I, I'm very curious to see what happens as they've started to open up things, because I think it's weird the way that they've done some of it. Like uh, opening up swimming pools seems a very odd first phase move to me. Um, I could see opening more retailers in that, but, uh, you know, gyms, public pools, stuff like that. I don't know. That's, that seems like a weird thing to me. That, what do you that's think? That's a little scary because that's close quarters. I mean, how do you stay away from people there, especially if a large group of people? Right. You know? And you can minimize the number of people in the pool, but somebody that was in it 10 minutes ago, uh, was still in it 10 minutes ago. Yes. And they're not really sure how this, uh, coronavirus actually can, uh, be, infect people. I mean, it can, you know, it can be on surface, it can be on water. I guess it could be on water. I don't know. Yeah. I'm not sure on the, on the water. I, I know that now they're going back and kind of recanting on some of the stuff that they've said about uh, the way it transfers on surfaces. Right. And uh, you know, if they've, if they've been testing it and they have new data, that's great. If they're, if they're saying that so that they have reason to start opening things up again, then I'm a little more skeptical. I think we're going to have another outbreak. I hate to say that, but I really have a feeling about that. You know? Yeah, I think so too. And I'm really hoping that I'm wrong, but yeah. you know, if you, if it, all it takes is one person, Oh, I know. you know, and that's the scary part. So I don't, I don't know how you would ever safely say, okay, you know what guys, we've done this long enough. We're in the clear. We were responsible the way we did it because there's still too many people that didn't take it seriously enough that could easily ruin it all we've worked for staying inside all this time well believe me they don't necessarily take it uh serious here because we've been around you see people out there with no masks mm -hmm. on at all yeah see and i i wear the mask because even if i'm not so much concerned about catching it as i am what if i'm a carrier where it didn't manifest and i could be giving it to someone else yeah you you wouldn't want to do that that's for sure no, I mean, even people I don't like, I wouldn't want to do that to. <laughs> Maybe a couple something of something else, but not that. <laughs> right. Yeah, there's plenty of ways to get even with people. Yes, I'll get <laughs> even with you. So when you uh, you guys are, are uh, also involved in performing at a church. Uh, well, Chandra is now. We were before. We actually were working for a, are you familiar with religious science? A little bit. Uh-huh. We actually were doing a religious science church in in actually the village of Oak Creek, which is adjacent to Sedona mm -hmm. uh, for 179. And we did that for quite a long time. Yeah. Yeah. Is that a different feel when you're performing uh, music in a venue like that? Yeah, it's a little different. Actually, church today, well, church today is a lot different than it used to be. Um, I actually first uh, uh, 
professional jobs when I was 20 years old was actually working in churches in Los Angeles, uh, First Baptist Church of Hollywood, the Presbyterian Church of Hollywood, and some other places. And it was pretty reverent back then. You didn't you didn't applaud or or do anything like that. Mm-hmm. Now you would find that actually in the Southern Baptist Church, actually you know a lot of that going on, but not so much in in the you know main, mainstream uh, religion or churches back then. Sure. Well, yeah, in the Southern churches, they're uh, the gospel ones, especially. They're very interactive. I mean, the the people aren't just sitting in their seats watching the performance. They're up and they're dancing and. Oh no, they're up, moving around, dancing. And, yeah, you know. yeah. I uh, I played drums in a church. Uh, oh wow. Uh, the uh, the guy that was the manager of the local music store called me up and said, "Hey, um, the uh, there's this church that needs a drummer. They lost their drummer, and they need somebody to fill in while they look for somebody. Are you interested?" And I said, "Well, sure. You know, I love to play. It's a good excuse to get out there and you know meet people and get behind the kit." So right. uh, I did that for I want to say it was a month, and I mean it's just a couple hours on Sunday, and. Uh, we would do like one rehearsal during the week and then, uh, and then we would just play. And uh, it was, an, it was a very interesting experience, but it turned out that the church was a front for Amway. They were using oh, the, the tax really? exempt status of the church to sell Amway to the parishioners. I'm boy. I'm boy. And I thought that's just, that's just sad. Yeah. We, we got, we got caught up in that too at one point and we were actually trying to hand things out flyers in a, uh, mall and people were throwing them at us because 2020 had done a, a number on one of their products called energy mm-hmm. where someone felt they had died from it or whatever. So I, I don't know, but we, they never, they never revealed that to us. And it was like, I don't want that. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, yeah. And that, you know, that's the thing is that media really does have a lot of power when it comes to just the, the, yeah. the fear factor of, of uh, manipulating people. Well, these are multi-level, uh, you know, companies anyway. So, mm-hmm. but you really have to work at you have to work at to make any money. Trust yeah. me. Yeah, we ended up with, it made us buy all this product. We ended up with all that product in our our garage and couldn't even move it. So it's like really. <laughs> I think that's probably the fate of most people that get into something. It sounds like a really good idea. They do a great job of explaining it, and you're like, oh wow, you know, I can do this in my spare time. And all right, all right. The next thing you know, you're stuck with a bunch of product and you can't oh, yeah. even break even. So after that happened with Amway, we were approached by other companies like, no way. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Goodbye. Have fun. Yeah. Good luck. It's it's not, not like you're, you're eating Baker, Baker's chocolate and you get fooled by it two or three times, hoping that maybe this time it'll be different. Right. I'm not saying that happened to me. I'm just saying. <laughs> yeah. So do you did uh did do you find that you miss that kind of work or do you prefer just regular straight performance? You mean work, working what? Do you mean uh, uh, doing music at the church? Oh, no, I I, uh, I like it all. I mean, the idea is what what do you, you know what whatever we can do. I, I love doing it. We actually came here with a multiplicity of of having done a lot of things in uh, San Diego or the LA area because when you live in a big city, you you have to reinvent yourself all the time in order to work. So bringing all all that here to Sedona, we were able to actually plug in everywhere: emceeing, acting, singing, writing, whatever whatever that that was we were doing there in California. We brought here, and it's worked out very well for us. It really has. I would imagine that, that there's some advantage to being in a, a heavy tourist town. And setting up shop there because you're playing, you could be playing for different people all the time. Whereas if you're trying to just do something in the local market, there's only so many times people are going to come out and see you. That's right. When we actually were looking to come to Sedona, maybe live here, uh, Shonda went on the internet and she found out that this was one of the number one in tourism in the country was Sedona. And whereas like San Diego, where we lived, was actually number eight. So it's like, that's made sense because it was not always easy to work there. We worked at SeaWorld. We did some things at the zoo. We worked in some of the uh, hotels there and everything else. But basically, that's about it. Yeah. You know? Well, and, and it can be tough to find uh, find your footing when you're going to a new place because you're are, you're competing with everybody who's already established. And that's right. Y- you you want to you know you want to engage. You want to work together, but you have to do what you have to do to survive too. Right. Very true. Well, and I, I would imagine the the uh, the gig at the ranch was a really nice one because you don't have to worry about 
uh, you know, selling the tickets and all that. You just show up and perform. That's right. Well, yeah, we, you actually, uh, as working there, you actually do dinner service. I would do plate retrieval and stuff like that. And then we do the show. There'd be myself and three other musicians, very talented. And like I said, I was doing this character. So I would dress up like a hillbilly and I talk like this. My name was Otis, you know, <laughs> <laughs> but that's fun. Isn't it? I mean, to just transform oh, yeah. yourself into somebody completely different. Absolutely. Did you kind of play that role the the whole time, or was it only when you were on stage? Uh, no, I played it just on stage. Just for on the most stage, part. Yeah. yeah. I was working with uh, a group of people that were doing plays at uh, Dave and Buster's, and they oh. would get hired by uh, corporations to do like you know corporate parties, but they would also do dinner theater and stuff. And right. uh, the director had challenged them one night after rehearsal uh, at Dave and Buster's to go out for fifteen minutes and interact with people as your character. Ah. Oh. So that you could kind of get to know that character pretty well. Um, I thought that was kind of an interesting experiment. And it was fun watching them because the people that they were interacting with were not there for a show. They were just there with their family, playing games, whatever. Uh, Certainly not prepared for what was happening to them. I'm sure, yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Was, was uh, Was it a crowd interactive role? Oh, well, yes. I mean, in a sense, I would... Uh, yeah, when I first did it, uh, I was, I had all these jokes that were state jokes. Okay. Mm-hmm. So it's like, uh, you you ain't getting this, but where are you from? And they say something like, uh, text. I said, Oh, that's, that's, that's where you have all the oil and oil wells. But you know what? I just realized that you may have the oil and oil wells, but you ain't got any way of checking them because all the dipsticks are in Washington. <laughs> like that. Or it's Very like, uh, Wisconsin, and you're out there breathing all the dairy air, you know, something like that. <laughs> right. Oh, uh, that would now see. That's the kind of lighthearted stuff that I would enjoy. Yeah, actually, you know, that's true. Uh, Kelly Ripa actually, and her family came there uh, one year, and she was lovely, and she had tears in her eyes afterwards. She said, "Oh, this is such a sweet place," and uh. she's so the humor is so, you know, it, it's so good, and it's not low or anything like that. It's true because it's all family oriented, you know. Right. Yeah. So you can only push the envelope so far uh, and you can't really get into, uh, you know, too heavy of topics because you want to keep it enjoyable for the young ones. Right. Which they can do in Vegas if they want to. You know. Right. We do have a similar place here. Um, I, I haven't been there in a while. I actually just went to the gift shop, I think, one time. But um, it, it's, it's very similar. It's out in the desert uh, near Red Rock Canyon. Oh, okay. And uh, it's it's like the same sort of thing. They have a saloon and homemade ice cream and all of that. Uh, I don't know what their status is, but it, it's very interesting to, to you could just walk behind a gate and feel like you're transformed into a completely different time. Oh, wow. And I, I really like that. I like things that take me away from the world. Me too. <laughs> yeah. That's why I was in science fiction, because it takes me away from the, the, this world here to another world. Yes. I can't imagine why you would want that. World of many possibilities. Yes. Where nothing has to be accurate or, or uh, right. you know, like within the confines of the laws that we know. Like it doesn't have to have gravity. It doesn't have to have breathable air or things like that. You know, you can have mutants that know how to breathe or survive in that atmosphere. Um, or, yeah. I, that's what I meant about the open palette. I really love that. Uh, you can just really take that and paint any picture on that canvas. Very good. Yeah. Yeah. I, I did like, uh, a little bit of the 50s sci-fi, but I got really tired of just all the round rockets and the weird, like curvy legs and stuff that the rockets would have. And, uh, I, I like sci-fi. Um, and now it's just kind of gotten out of control because it's, it's just too easy to make. So it doesn't have to have quality. Oh, I know. And, with you know, with everything being gener, you know, the generated thing, you know, it's like everything seems the same all the time to me. Yeah, yeah, I feel like there's not a lot of creativity. It's like, hey, people like this, so let's duplicate it, and we'll just we'll we'll change the idea slightly. We'll make it a different type of character, but in the end, it's basically the same story over and over again. Mm-hmm. And that's a shame because it, we could do so much more. One of my favorite, you go back to the fifties though. One of my favorite movies was the day the earth stood still, mm. which was adapted from a book by Harry Bates called farewell to the master. And that one started the late actor, Michael Rennie, Patricia Neal, Hugh Marlowe, Sam Jaffe, who played the uh, doctor in there and everything else. And that was a great film. I love that film. Yeah. And that was very well done, especially for the, for that time. Yeah. Yeah. With the famous words, Klaatu Barada Nikto. 
<laughs> Did you, uh, were you a fan of the Twilight Zone then? Oh, I love the Twilight Zone. Yeah. Absolutely. Me too. I love how many uh, famous people were on that show that might not have been as well known when they were on it. Right. It kind of gave them their start there on the show. Mm-hmm. Burgess Meredith was in a couple of episodes. Right. Uh, you know, William Shatner, so many great people. And uh, I I loved that there was always some sort of uh, just the, the twist that that show would have. Mm-hmm. Uh, was something that always fascinated me. I started getting to the point where I would watch the episode trying to predict the twist right. instead of just enjoying the story. Brilliant. It was actually, actually brilliant writing. It was a wonderful show. Yes. Serling really had quite a concept there. And, you know, he, he did the screenplay for the original Planet of the Apes, mm-hmm. which was written by Pierre Boyer, who had done Bridge on the River Kwai. And in the, in the actual story, as versus the one in the movie, at the end of the movie, you see uh, Charlton Heston as a character there saying, damn you, damn you, you went ahead and you did it. And then all of a sudden, the camera pans over and you see the Statue of Liberty. So, I mean, that was worth a thousand words. Oh, sure. Because you realize, oh, my God, he's he's on Earth. That's where he is. Right. And that was the great thing about the Twilight Zone is that you never really knew a, a lot of times where people were. Sometimes it turned out uh-huh. they were in a dollhouse and they didn't know it. You're traveling on a journey. <laughs> yes. Well, we have a uh, a Twilight Zone miniature golf course here. Oh, do you? We do. It's very surreal. It's kind of a glow in the dark sort of thing. But they have oh, like wow. a, a statue of Taki Tina. They've got the, uh, the oh. you know, a couple of the alien statues, and so it's a lot of fun. Um, but I that was a scary episode. Yes, they they represented a lot of like the more popular ones. I am talking Tina, and that I was. Don't like uh, you very much. Uh, Telly Savalas was the one that was in that one. Yes, he was. Mm-hmm. Yes, he was. Uh, another he great Bojack, guest. right? Yes. Mm-hmm. And uh, I just, I love the show, but I heard, and I don't know if this is true, but I heard that Rod Serling wanted to make a more of a documentary show talking about things that he knew because he had been visited by aliens and was told a lot of things and uh, the network would not go for it. So he wrote some of those things into the episodes because that was the only way he could get the truth out. Right. Well, that's often the way it was. People would write science fiction. They knew things, but they didn't want to be run out of town on a rail for, for mentioning something that would be like, no, you can't say that. Sure. And the network certainly wasn't going to take responsibility for putting that information out there. Absolutely not. You know, so I wonder though, now when I watch episodes, I'm like, well, wait a minute though. Is that what was true? Was that something that was real? Maybe you never know. It's good. But yeah, no, I really enjoyed that show. And when they when they tried to bring it back um, without Serling, it just it didn't have that same magic. No, it wasn't the same. It really wasn't. No. You know, actually, I met him. Uh, I was working uh, a place uh, called this, the El Cortez Hotel. And I was working up in the uh, top room and I came down the elevator and he got into the elevator. So I had a chance to actually talk to him, tell him how much I really enjoyed the show. So that oh. was a experience. That's awesome. Yeah. I'm uh, I'm not a big celebrity hound type person. Like I, I, I don't keep like lists of people I've met or whatever. But if there's somebody that has had a profound influence over my career as a, as a musician or a writer or somebody whose work I've just really, really enjoyed and, and been inspired by, it, it is a big deal for me to get to tell them that. And man, Rod Serling would have been somebody amazing to get the chance to talk to. Well, he was brilliant. You know, he wrote Requiem for a Heavyweight, too, you know. Oh, I didn't know that. Well, Requiem for a Heavyweight, actually, Jack Palance was playing the boxer in, that, in the movie. I think it was Anthony Quinn. But uh, in, the tw- in the episode on, t- on TV, when he actually uh, produced it on television, uh, he had he had Ed, Ed Wynn and Keenan Wynn. And Ed had done a lot of burlesque. He had not done TV and he was having problems remembering his lines. And they actually wanted to get rid of him. And Jack Plants said, no, you get rid of him. You have to get rid of me. So he helped him. And actually, Ed went on to winning a, uh, I guess, uh, you know, an Emmy for, for his uh, part in the, in the Requiem. That's very interesting. And, and Jack Plant, what a great actor that guy was. I love uh, just his voice. He could, he could just read books and I would listen to him all day. Oh, I know. I know. And on the Academy Awards, he was up in Asia. He actually did a couple one arm push ups. Like, really? Wow. <laughs> I could see him doing that. 
Yeah. Yeah. Very, very uh, colorful actor, but he was one of those people that was just, you could feel that he was classically trained. He just had that way about him where he knew where to stand. He knew where to look. He knew how to talk. He right. just, he was a good package for an actor. He was. Yeah. Well, who was, who was somebody that you, you know, as you were growing up and, and becoming a musician, who was it that you were, you were influenced by? Well, as singers, I was influenced by Gordon McRae, uh, Howard Keel, John Ray. I actually worked with John. And uh, I, I had worked with Howard, and he came up to me one night when we were doing a show, and he said, Tom, you have a great voice. And I thought, oh, my God, you have no idea how exciting that is for you to say that to me. You're one of my idols. So mm -hmm. for you to tell me that if your idol would tell you he thinks you're a great singer, that was wonderful. Oh, that's there's there's almost nothing in the world better than that moment. Oh, I know. Wow, I'm I like that. Now, were, were these? I'm not familiar with these. Were they uh, blues singers, folk singers? Oh no, they were they were actually Broadway and oh. the movie. Howard Keel did uh, you know uh, Seven Brides for Seven Brothers, uh, and I'm trying to think what other movies he did too. And Gordon McRae, of course, did Carousel, and uh, also. Uh, what was the other one he did? Uh, I, just, I, remember, I can't remember right now. Hmm. I, uh, a couple of weeks ago, what my guest was Eileen Graff, who was the uh, second person to play Sandy in the original Broadway production of Grease. Oh, wow. Really? And when I posted that on Instagram, Grease 1978 liked the, the post, and I thought, I never would have thought that Grease would be liking anything I ever did. Really? <laughs> it's kind of one of those beautiful things about the, the age that we live in. But uh, you're not really like a, an internet guy, are you? No, no. Chandra is, but I'm not. It's, um, it's, a, it's a different world. I know. You know, it, it, very different. When you think about the way that you have to promote yourself, it's not going to, you know, 10 or 15 bars or uh, telephone poles and nailing a flyer to it. It's, you know, writing up a press release and digitally releasing right. it to your mailing list and, it's uh, it's way different than the old days. I'm sure. <laughs> I, I miss those flyer days sometimes. You know, you just go from place to place. You hit downtown with uh, maybe 20 flyers and a, a hammer and a bag of nails, and you're good to go. I We did a lot of MCing all the time when we were in California. We did that. And so one year I was hired, and this was actually through Chandra's mom, to uh, do the Cody Awards, which is the Software Association Awards. It's back in the 80s. And so that year... Steve Jobs was getting lifetime achievement and Bill Gates flew in to give it to him. And I actually introduced both of them, took pictures with them. And, but I wasn't really into computers or anything like that. So I didn't know what these, who these guys were that, that well. And later, of course, they changed the whole world. Oh yeah. Yeah. I've been to a few events where, um, cause I'm not a very, uh, savvy pop culture guy. So I could walk past 20 or 30 celebrities and probably not even know who they are. And, uh, and, and in Vegas, of course, you never know because a lot of them come here. But uh, but I yeah, I found out afterwards. In fact, I was at uh, the NAMM show this year in, in Anaheim. Oh, yeah. And uh, I, I was waiting to talk to Steve Morse, the guitarist from Deep Purple. Okay. And uh, I, I was in the front of the line. I had arranged it to be in the front, be the first person to talk to him. And before he came out, they had somebody else come out and uh, had like 20 minutes before Steve was going to come out. So there's this other guy comes and sits down at the table and I'm standing there first in line. I'm like, I don't know who this guy is. I don't know what to stay. I, I'm just awkwardly standing here being the first person that he's going to talk to. And who was it? I still don't know. <laughs> oh, okay. But apparently he was somebody of note because he's there, you know, at the NAMM show representing the, the string company and all that. But right. uh, but I felt bad. So I just I, I was very honest with him. I was like, I, I'm sorry. I, I don't know who you are. And he goes, well, not everyone does. And he was like, well, I'm a performer. I do this and that. I'm like, oh, well, it was really great to meet you. You know, thanks for coming out. And I shook his hand and I went to the back of the line to wait for Steve. And the whole time I'm like, I don't know who that guy was. But he had oh. to be somebody of of notoriety to be doing a meet and greet at the NAM show. No, no. So, yeah, I, I I wish I was a little bit more up on pop culture, but I'd rather be. I don't know. I'd rather be writing. Yeah. Well, the NAMM show is great with all the new toys that they come out with. You know? Oh, it is. It's, it's, it's hard because you want to just buy everything. <laughs> yeah. Tell me about it. But at the same point, I like, I, for some reason, I'm not a guitar player, 
but I'm fascinated with pedal boards. Are you? I am. And I, do, I, I just think they're neat. And so, you know, there's thousands of them at the NAMM show. And I'll walk up and down the aisles going, okay, I see how they hooked that up. Okay, they arranged it this way. That's really neat. I wonder what that pedal does. And, and I have no reason to care. <laughs> I think part of it is the atmosphere. It just makes you want everything that you see. Absolutely. It's promoted very well. You know, my grandfather actually was a uh, incredible teacher. He was the headmaster for the school of Avalon on Catalina before the war broke out. Mm-hmm. And that, of course, was Catalina was was uh, owned by Wrigley, Wrigley Gum, you know? Oh, I remember. Yeah. OK. And then he he actually walked with John Philip Sousa, who did, you know, Stars and Stripes Forever and some of these great uh, marches. And I learned guitar from him. He was an incredible guitarist and musician and composer and writer. My dad also was a lyricist, you know? Mm-hmm. So so I came from like I said, a musical family, so I couldn't escape it. <laughs> right. <laughs> but but who would want to? I mean, it's it's just oh, such a, a fun thing to do with your time. And if, if you could turn it into a business without losing the love for it, because I think that tends to happen to a lot of people when they don't find the success they're looking for or see sometimes it's really hard to sustain. I think people fall out of out of love with music because the of the business side of it. Yeah, that's very, very true. You know, it gets where you, you lose the creativity that way because mm-hmm. you're so involved in the business. I hear that from people that, that do music licensing for a living, too, where they're just, you know, here's here's the song I need. OK, I'll write it for you. And it, it's almost uh, formulated writing where there's not really a passion in it. They're just kind of cranking out a response to whatever the question is. And uh, that makes me really sad. I, I can't imagine not loving creating music. Oh, I know. When we do our shows here, Chandra actually puts together all the tracks for all the music, you know, build, builds all the the songs and everything. So I just show up and sing. That's all I say. I, say, I show up. <laughs> he does all the work. She actually is a sound person, too. So, mm-hmm. you know. <laughs> yeah, that's true. But that, but that's great because all you have to do is just do the fun part. Right. Right. Um, but there are people that really enjoy those other aspects, too. Like, I really got tired of being a live audio engineer. Um, oh, I didn't know you were that. Oh, Sorry. yeah. Yeah, I've done that for uh, years. Um, there are some great gigs and some gigs that just make you want to pluck your eyes out and step on them. Right. Uh, but but for me, it's just the enjoyment of being a part of something that makes people happy or makes them think or makes them feel something. You know, that to me is is the biggest part of performing. I agree. Or any aspect of the production side of something, I should say. True. Because if you're if you're releasing music, you don't get to see the joy of uh, of the listener. In fact, most of the time, you don't even know if anyone's listening or if if they are who they are. Um, you have no idea. So the idea of being a live performer or involved in the production, like as an audio engineer, uh, you really do get to experience that in in a way that you don't as a solo musician that that doesn't gig. And you did it for so many how many years? Uh, let's see. It's going on. Are oh, you still doing it? Okay. Uh, the last, yeah, I, I don't do it that much anymore. I've done some gigs up here since I moved to Vegas, but I right. think I started when I was 19. So I'm 47 now. Mm-hmm. So uh, going on 30 years. Wow. I've been in business. I mean, I did other things as well, but, uh, but I did a lot of audio engineering gigs. Right. Yeah. Well, I I've, been in business, like, I've been in the business 55 years. So. Wow. Uh-huh. Do you still love it as much as you did in the beginning? Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. I think that's the magic. You know, I, I think about bands that go out and they play the same songs over and over for 30 years. And there's so many of those bands from the 60s and 70s that are still doing it. And I think you must get tired of playing those songs. But most of them will say when you see the crowd react, when you see that energy that they're getting excited that you're playing that song, it just right. it just makes you enjoy doing it. I agree. Yeah. yeah. Does. Is there is there anything that you would suggest for somebody these days that that really wants to become a musician and they they don't know where to start? I would say become as proficient as you can if you if it's a guitar, piano, whatever, and and just learn everything you can. Learn learn the theory of music so you can actually read and do things like that. Because the more you can do, the the better it is. I mean, you know, Glenn Campbell actually was a studio musician before he became a big star. Mm-hmm. That's right. So, 
Yeah. That's right. Do you think it's harder today to break into the business because there's so many people doing it and it's so accessible now? Or do you think that it was harder before because there weren't as many places to get into? That's hard to say. I I, I don't know. I It may be harder today. I don't know. I had quite a few opportunities when I was younger. For me as a composer, one of the biggest challenges I hear is that uh, it's all been done. You know, you can't create anything new. And, and I have to disagree with that because I think there's a lot of different colors that you can paint anything. But as a, as a performing musician, I, I would think the challenge today is keeping the crowd engaged because so many people will start looking at their phones in the middle of a concert uh, or, or, you know, talk to the person next to them and not pay attention. You're inundated by so many things out here today that, that most people are, are distracted. So they're not really paying attention. Yeah. And, and I think that we all know that the attention span is shorter. I mean, you don't see bands doing 10 and 15 minute drum solos anymore. No. Well, we no, and you, you don't have guitar solos. You had that back like in the eighties. Mm-hmm. Kind of like this for that reason right there. Yeah. Yeah, very true. And I think about the music of the 70s where a song would stretch out to one side of an album. Oh, yeah. <laughs> no one does that anymore. If you really go back in time to like the, say, the 40s, you go back to some of the standards. Mm-hmm. I, I used to, I worked with like Tex Benneke and some of these band, big bands. And as a singer for them, you would sit in a chair in front of the horn section. And so when it's time for you to sing, you would go up there and sing actually the introduction to the song. People would be holding each other out on the dance floor. And after you get done with that, the uh, drums or whatever would kick, kick in the rhythm and people start dancing. They don't have introductions these days. No, they don't. That's really fascinating, though. Yeah. I didn't know that. Oh, yeah. Well, I suppose you would only do that with the with the songs that were maybe hits or something that was well known, right? Oh, of course. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's a fascinating style of things, though. I wonder when they stopped doing that. I don't know. I mean, you had that in the 40s, you had it in the 50s. Mm-hmm. I think if you go to the 60s, 70s, I don't, I'm not sure. I don't think they had that then. I'm not sure. I don't mm-hmm. think so. I can't think of a time where I've heard that in, in those eras. No, I would say maybe that's in the 50s it stopped. Uh, probably so, yeah. Yeah. Wow. It's It's such a fascinating thing to watch how the business has changed over the years. But the one thing that, that doesn't change is that you can still touch people with art. Well, that's why you do it, right? Exactly. That's Well, that's why I love so you, doing it. So you can move them, make them laugh or cry or whatever. You know, that's true of singing, true of acting, whatever. Exactly. You know? Exactly. Now, you do you do some comedy acting with Chandra as well? Yes, actually, we uh, we're doing we did children's shows for libraries, but on top of that, we we do these murder mysteries. Oh, that's right. Yeah. And we have one of our friends, Deb Ross. She's an Emmy Award winning writer for like Winnie the Pooh and did Land Before Time for Disney, and so she writes the scripts for these uh, murder mysteries. And in the one murder mystery, I play Alcatraz gangster. <laughs> I love these little plays on names. That's so much fun. And we're, all, we're all improv, so we actually can work off each other, but it's not always following the script. If something happens, we can just, you know, fill in. Mm-hmm. Well, that's the kind of stuff I love. I, I hate when people are so rigid that they right. they have to walk the, the line and be in their exact spot every time. Um, it doesn't feel natural to me. When I've gone and seen any kind of uh, dinner theater, especially like a murder mystery dinner theater, um, I want it to be really fluid and really just in the moment and reactionary. I don't want it to feel scripted. I agree. Yeah. yeah. And and you're right. Dev is a great writer. She's a, she's such a lovely lady too. Mm-hmm. You've interviewed her. Yeah. She was on uh, episode 50 of, uh, of oh. this podcast. And, uh, but I've known her for a few years now and she's, oh, yeah. she's, she's one of my favorite people. She has an amazing background. She really does. I have to tell you the story when we came from San Diego to uh, Sedona here, we were told to look up this gal who had written Land Before Time and all these things for Winnie the Pooh and said, you want to get to know her. She lives in Sedona. And of course, that's Deb. So uh, there was a theater here called Canyon Moon. And it's a regional theater. And there was a show called uh, that, that we actually ended up uh, being in together. And it was her. I didn't even realize she, she played my wife in it. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> Small world. I guess you yeah. guys were just meant to be friends. There you go. Yeah. And how could you not want to work on something that she wrote? Oh, she's an amazing writer. Yeah, very much so. And uh, 
just just an amazing la- uh, lady as well. And her husband, John's another just very talented guy. And yeah. uh, there's a lot of talent over there in Sedona. Yeah, he was a lighting director for some of the movies, like I think Close Encounters and others. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he worked on uh, Jaws and E.T. and right. uh, the, the Twilight Zone movie that they did. Right. And uh, yeah, I, I've got to get him on the show, too. He's, he's, he's a wonderful director. He's a wonderful director. He lets you spread out and expand and do what you want to do without trying to box you in or anything, you know? Mm-hmm. And a super nice guy at that. He is, yeah. But do they, so when you work with John and did, do they get uh, like difficult to work with? Do they get like really serious and buckle down at times or is it pretty just relaxed and, and natural? It's pretty relaxed and natural, yeah. That's good. That's good. I think most people would probably work better under those circumstances, especially people that do improv. Oh, absolutely, yeah. Yeah. Wow. Fascinating stuff. I love this. I love this. I So my last question for you, let's say that you had a chance to have a conversation with an alien. What would you want to ask them? What would I want to ask them? Well, that's a good question. Let's see. Huh. Um, is this the only planet besides yours with life? Ooh, that's good. I think I would have so many things flooding my head that I would probably just ask them something stupid like, do you guys have chocolate where you come from? (laughs) Because in that moment, I think I would just be so mystified by what I'm seeing that I probably wouldn't have. uh, And I know myself well enough to know that I would not have reasonable control over my faculties. Well, here's the thought. You know, one of the... uh to me, an innovative show, of course, was Star Trek when it came out. Mm-hmm. Made a lot of social statements. It was also the very first interracial kiss between William Shatner and Nicole Nichols. Oh. Uh, who, yeah, because uh, she was African-American and he was, of course, you know, Caucasian. Mm-hmm. So that was the first time they actually did that. But they, they actually did a lot of social statements, like the one time when Frank Gorsh, you know who he is, or was, you know, uh, was he played the Riddler, you know, and Batman and all that. And he was like white on one side and black on the other. He was actually this, this uh, so-called criminal who was white on the, say, the right side and black on the, right, the, the left side. And, so, and, and uh, Spock said to him, uh, Leonard Nimoy, uh, yes, but wasn't there, wasn't there a time when you were all the same? And he said, yes, I guess so, you know, but, but there was a lot of prejudice there because he was black on the wrong side or, or white on the wrong side. Oh, wow. That is, that's a really interesting commentary yeah. on, on, you know, and if you think about it too, now Star Trek would have been either slightly before maybe, or right around the same time as shows like Archie Bunker and the Jeffersons. Right. And you think about the dialogue that they had on those shows. You could never get away with that today. Oh, no way. <laughs> you know? So, yeah. yeah, you're right, though. If you if you really look at Star Trek and you break down a lot of the, the storylines or things that they put in there, you're right. They do make good social commentaries, especially for that time. But I think a lot of those still hold up today. Yeah. What I, what I wanted to say was there was an episode called Aaron of Mercy and it was on this planet called Organia. And they land on this planet, uh, Spock and Shatner, as uh, to Captain Kirk. And and uh, Spock says, they have not progressed for like thousands of years. Well, it turned out they they weren't really human humanoid. They were actually like energy beings, but they assumed this form because they said, you would never be able to understand us. Oh, yeah. Well, that, that makes sense. Makes me, wonder if there's, makes me wonder if there's life out here that would be so advanced that we would be like an amoeba to them. I could see the possibility of that. You never know. I certainly could. I have to think that that there are races out there that are younger than us, but I have to think that there are races that have been around far longer than we have. Oh, absolutely. And are, are just incredibly advanced. Um, I, I would hate to think that of all of it, we're just the only ones in this. You know, that would just be so pointless. That doesn't make sense to me. No. But people say too, well, why if, if if aliens exist, why don't they come and visit us? And I'm like, what what makes us so interesting? Maybe they don't even know about us. Could be. You know, we're a tiny little dot. <laughs> a little speck in the in the universe, right? Exactly. So you think about a bacteria that could be growing in uh, in a drop of water. You're not right. gonna see that. No, you're not. You know, I don't know. It's interesting. I, I hope 
that at some point I get some kind of visitation where I could ask something better, loftier than chocolate. <laughs> but if it ever happens, I'll let you know. Please do that. I would be very <laughs> interested in knowing that. Absolutely. Well, Tom, thank you so much for coming on the show. I've had such a great time talking to you. I'm wonderful talking with you too, Scott. Thank you, my friend. You take care. I I will keep my fingers crossed uh, that that everything works out for the ranch. That is such a, a it's such a sad thing that I think a lot of people are experiencing right now. And you know, you you work your whole life to build something, and then it, it can be swept away with something as simple as a virus. And I really hope that they're able to pull through, or maybe some investor comes in and sees some value in it and helps them out. I agree with that one for sure. Thank you so much for having me on your show. Thank you. My pleasure. Let's reach out to Kelly Ripa and see if, if she remembers. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you take All care, right. my friend. Thank you so you much. Oh, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Man, oh man, what a dynamic and interesting guy. I'm so glad that uh, we found some time to sit down and chat. Uh, I don't know when they're going to do another Facebook Live concert, but the concert that they did is up on uh, the website and uh, or on Facebook. Uh, you can watch the replay of it. Very, very cool stuff. Very, uh, very fun to watch, you know, and, and to see people that are just born to be entertainers doing their thing. So uh, thank you. Tom, uh, thank you so much, Tom, for coming on the show. Really appreciate it. If you guys want to get a hold of me, have guest suggestions or requests or whatever connections, uh Give me, uh, send me an email at scott at scotthaskin.com and tune in next week for another show. This is a very special episode coming up and we'll see you next week on the Haskin Cast podcast. <laughs>